What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the Hot Sauce. This is Angel Planel, a registered dietitian nutritionist in Seattle, Washington. I just cracked 100 subscribers, and the goal is to make it to 250. So do me a solid and like, comment, and subscribe, and let's get right into it. Today we are going to feature Cicely Thomas, a registered dietitian that resides in Cartersville, Georgia, a suburb of Northwest Atlanta. All right, everybody, welcome back to the hot sauce. This is Angel Planels, and today we have Cicely Thomas. She was one of the individuals featured in the Heroes video at Fancy, and so I have the pleasure of having her here today. I'd like to allow her to introduce herself and tell us about her journey. So, Cicely, I'm going to put you in the hot seat here. Okay. Your hot seat. So, just relax and uh, yeah, just go ahead and tell us about your journey. Um, well, my name is Cicely Thomas, and uh, I'm currently a Nutrition Service Director in Northwest Georgia. Um, I work for Department of Public Health, and I've been here actually through several seats over the past 22 years. Okay, cool. Would you like to kind of tell us about, I guess, what would inspire you to get into the profession? What... Uh, where do you go to college? Where do you do yeah. your internship? And just kind of give us give us that journey. Well, um, oddly, uh, I will say that I didn't just uh, have a plan to go into public health. Um, my original, um, well, I went to Georgia Southern University in Georgia, South Georgia, and uh, I actually went to study music. Oh, and <laughs> um, while I was there, I quickly changed. And as most college students do, I went through several little um, spouts of what I wanted to do. And um, but my first year there, my grandmother, who had type two diabetes, um, passed away in the spring of my first year. Um, I'd always had questions uh, about her disease and how I could basically help her because she was most important to me. Um, and so a couple of years at to Georgia Southern, I met um, a person who was in the dietetics program. Um, they were doing a presentation. I got involved and decided, yeah, this is what I want to do. And so that's when I changed my major finally to nutrition. And oddly enough, I was actually had decided I was going to go into physical therapy, but I met my husband and changed. <laughs> I would just stay in nutrition at Georgia Southern. Um, so that's initially how I got started. Um, and then um, just along the way, I, I got my first job in a professional job in public health. Um, and so, well, actually, I, I, one of the jobs right out of college was more so sales. I thought it was in nutrition, but it was about sales. And I realized very quickly um, that what they were selling was, wasn't true and that um, I, I had gone to school for a reason. Um, our focus is scientific evidence-based research, and I knew I didn't want to be a part of that. And so I actually uh, applied for several jobs with public health, but I was pregnant. And um, when I went to my interview, that uh, I, I actually applied for WIC services um, because I was newly married. Um, I never received, growing up, I, my family, we never received any kind of benefits like that. My, my parents um, were, you know, fairly able to take care of my, our family. So I never knew anything about those services. But someone had came to Georgia Southern. Her name was Beth Holloway. And at that time, she worked for the state of Georgia and talk to us about WIC services and what a nutritionist does in that program. So being pregnant um, after graduation, I went into the local health department, which was in Bartow County, and the dietitian there was named Rebecca Vinson. And she actually did my nutrition assessment. And I was, you know, in your assessment, of course, you have basic conversation. And she realized that my degree was in nutrition and said, hey, we need a nutritionist. Are you interested? And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty pregnant, but I'm interested. <laughs> and so that's, uh, you know, I, I got hired on a, um, seven and a half, eight months pregnant is how I got on to, to WIC. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. What, um, <clears throat> and so you've been the... Uh, from your video, you've you've been a director for how long and how many counties are you responsible for and, and all that? So, 
Uh, yeah, so my district is Northwest Georgia District. We cover 10 counties. That is, and we're adjacent to Tennessee and to Alabama because okay. um, we're in Northwest. And so I have a county that actually kind of sits over the Tennessee line. It's called Dade County, Trenton, Georgia. And the further south is um, Paulding County and Harrison County. And so Harrison County is really probably the closest to the Alabama um, line. And um, so it's 10 counties that we I oversee. I have been in this same district the entire time. Um, I was entry-level nutritionist and actually while working here, I've been here the entire time. So my focus is public health, but I've done a whole lot of different positions. And um, as far as outside work, hospital, um, hospice, acute care. And so when I was, when I started, I was entry level. And from there, I started uh, Department of Public Health offers a dietetic internship. So I actually got, went through the dietetic internship while I was employee because the Department of Public Health offers an internship where they pay you full benefits and full pay and you're allowed to do your internship. And so you're really only actually working in the clinic part-time and the other time you're doing internship uh, rotations. And so I completed that. And um, my year of that was 2003. And at the same time, I was actually working on a master's program uh, from the local uh, University of Berry College here in Rome, Georgia um, for a degree in math grades, middle science, oh, excuse me, middle grades, math and science, and decided that I could not, um, I couldn't do that every night of the week and be in an internship. <laughs> it was a um, much. So, yeah, it was a little much with a baby. I had a baby. Um, and so I, I backed out and I, after completing a year and a half, I backed out. And then after completing my internship, I got accepted into University of Georgia. And okay. so I actually completed my master's there as uh, in adult education. And that was under advice of a mentor um, that had worked for the state for quite some time. Her name was Beverly Demetrius. And she actually, I think I'm a little different because I applied for her job before I actually got hired in um, Northwest Georgia. At the time she was director of Cobb County. And when I didn't get her job, I called her and I said, hey, can you give me pointers why I didn't get the job? Tell me what I done wrong. And at that time, she be kind of became a mentor for me. Um, and she, her advice was, you know, if you're going to do um, nutrition, no matter what your focus is, get you some experience in other disciplines because it's going to make you better all around. And so that's why I decided to do education because, of course, in community, what are we doing? We're educating adults. Um, that's where our focus should be. We're trying to help people live healthier lives. We're giving them advice, but more so we're concerned about their well-being and we need to know how to talk to them. And so my focus was adult ed, and that's where I got my um, master's degree at uh, University of Georgia. Awesome. Yeah. And so since then, you know, I worked, I, I um, when I became licensed in 2005, registered, I became a registered dietitian in 2005, mm -hmm. I, um, my, a mentor here in Northwest Georgia actually brought me into the district position. And so for the first five years, I had served as like the entry level and clinic level um, nutritionist and um, it, <laughs> You know, just to not to harp on it, but it was a very trying time for me um, those first few years. Um, but um, when I got into uh, working at the district level, I had someone that was really um, enthusiastic about me and my growth. Her name was her name is Rhonda Tankersley. She is now the the state director, internship director for DPH. Um, but at the time, she was a local nutrition service director for the district. And that's who brought me on. And so I began traveling the 10 counties. So I got very familiar with every clinic, my employees, and even participants. And so it was easy over the years to transition into the place of director. When she took her position at the state level in 2012, um, I took position as interim. I was interim for quite a long time um, before I actually got the job, but 
um, not to go into much detail, that was a trying time too. So <laughs> I'll say I had many, many uh, years and uh, events or experiences that could have made me or could have broken me. Um, I think at, at the time I felt damaged, but I was not broken. And I just, I made up in my mind that I was going to be what people thought I wasn't going to be. And I really think that's probably why I stayed in public health so long. It really wasn't that I was determined to have a career in public health. It was to prove that I belonged here. Um, it was to create my space. It was to be heard. And it was to make sure that people like me were heard. And, and so it was a really, really tough fight in the beginning, a struggle. Um, but as I grew, as I gained experience, as I gained education, as I gained uh, leadership, new leadership and supportive leadership that really believed in me, um, I grew. And so I've been in the position of director since 2012. Um, and since that time, you know, that you, you're not just one person. You We are deep in everything that we do. So at the same time, when you're you're trying to maintain your career or further your career. You have a family, um, you have children. Um, and so you have your um, life as far as your faith and what you're doing. And so I had all these different parts that were moving uh, for me that I was trying to juggle. Um, and so, over, you know, as, as time passed, I just uh, stayed focused on what I wanted and what I was trying to do for my family. Um, I have four children. So my older two, you know, that was in the beginning, I was pregnant. And then a year later, I was pregnant again. And <laughs> I was helping Wick out, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I always say that um, every time I thought I was like, I was going to leave. It was like, God was like, oh, no, you're pregnant again. Talk to your people. So, hey, I'm just like, I'm pregnant. I'm breastfeeding. And so I'm like doing everything that my clients are doing so I can relate. And that's, that was really like, it was my life. It, it really was. And I think that wasn't necessarily a clear separation from my personal life to the people I seen every day. Like I went, I left my home from crying children and I went into a building with crying children. And <laughs> it was just something that I, I do. I, you know, I continue to do and something I've done every day. Um, so, you know, my life has evolved since that time. So many things have changed um, personally and professionally. Uh, in 2018, I started my doctorate journey at University of North Florida. And so, you know, hopefully I'm finishing um, this semester. Uh, it's, it's been a journey, but, you know, even that focus is on the work that I do here because I think it's so it's so valuable. Um, sometimes for us in the work that we do here in public health, we are the only people that are remotely close to being uh, in the medical field. So we have participants, moms who come in, have never saw attention from a um, medical, a physician, or even right. saw a nurse, any, any healthcare provider, any healthcare provider, and then we have a, a whole different population who who don't have insurance. Um, you know, some of them are um, not here legally, and so they're really timid and they don't want to give information. So you really have to work hard to try to gain their trust and help them get treatment and, and try to refer them out to other programs that's going to be able to help them. But there's so much fear um, with, you know, certain population. That's really hard to do. So my focus here has always to be to create diversity, create an environment where the people that we serve, they can identify with people that look like them. Um, that has always been a target of mine, and I continue to do that in every single clinic that I have. Um, we have five clinics that have a very high Hispanic caseload, and so I uh, I have always been driven to make sure that I have at least um, one person in that clinic uh, that they could see that could speak to them. And so it, it was more than just hiring an interpreter or using a language line. It was having a physical person there that could speak to that individual to gain them trust. You know, when I started in um, 
2000, I, I was working in a clinic that had a pretty high Hispanic caseload and most of my clients did not speak English. And I would sit there 20 minutes just like waiting for an interpreter. And so I got uh, a little bit inventive and I started looking up words and <laughs> teaching myself. But the funny thing about it was as I taught myself, you know, I had Spanish in high school, but, you know, we don't do well in that. We just kind of get through it. And so when I came into the field of work, I started teaching myself and then my clients realized I was trying to help them. So then they would like teach me along the way. And so as I grew in my profession, even though I left the front line, I knew that this was important. And yeah. so I tried to make sure that, you know, I had somebody that was have that same level of communication or uh, enthusiasm about reaching out to our participants. And so that's been very strong for me. Um, as far as creating just a, a whole environment of diverse people to reach out to who we need to reach out and make sure that they feel comfortable because they will tell you if they feel comfortable, they'll tell you what their needs are. And so, you know, even going back to where we think people, um, you know, some of our participants never receive medical care. So you have a, a participant that hasn't, that's six months pregnant, haven't seen the doctor. Um, and so, you know, one of our focuses for public health and in and WIC is to try to make sure that all prenatals are, are on our program within the first trimester, but that also that we refer them out to uh, an OBGYN. And so we have some partnerships. We have um, physicians that we refer out to, and some of our physicians have like payment plans but for people who do not have insurance. So we can try to make sure that we encourage our participants to seek medical attention. You know, then we have our immunizations in the health department, so we can refer them right over to immunizations. We have our Children's First, um, which is a program specifically for our children with special needs, and so we refer them to there. We have family planning, um, which helps our moms who are not interested and having more children. So, of course, that helps them with that and it helps them with um, seeking medical attention to have mammograms and um, annual checkups for their, you know, in their female organs because that's what they need and they're not getting that. They're not getting it from anywhere else. So, and I think that, you know, even most recently, COVID has really, really emphasized what our jobs are as public health because people forget and it's not intentional, but we were here every single day through COVID. So when other people got to go home, we did not. Um, even when our door shut because we had a major outbreak when in, in March of 2020 to where we had several people pass away as a result of a gathering in one of our districts um, at a church affiliation, it took a toll on our district because all our nurses were everywhere um, and they were pulled in every direction and so um, for my program um, I transitioned my program to a virtual platform and I did that because people don't stop eating um, <laughs> because COVID is here yeah. you know they don't have resources they don't have food um, and even though we're not food stamps um, we can't give them a whole lot of food, but we can give them what the program allows. And I stress to my employees every day, it's not your responsibility to limit or restrict what someone gets. It's your responsibility to make sure you make every effort to give them what the program allows them to have. Uh, because that's we don't write the guidelines. Um, when, when people say it takes an act of, act of Congress, for WIC services, it does. It's a federally it does. Federal, Yeah. So it's not, you know, people say that jokingly, but for us, it does. So any changes that may, that are made in WIC has to come, you know, they have to be voted upon that. That's not anything we can do, but we know initial, initially our service is to serve our participants. If you are income eligible and you come to hear my objective, my priority is to make sure that you receive a service, um, you know, and, and sometimes it's difficult because sometimes we are short, you know, COVID took a lot out of us. People were sick and you can't demand somebody come to work because if they're COVID, then they take out your whole workforce. So, um, you know, that time took us in 
every single direction um, that we had everybody, you know, in every position getting sick. And at that time, that was the 14 days that you couldn't come into work. And so we were functioning, but we were barely functioning. Uh And so I had great support team, my health director, my program manager and district nursing director um, supported me in the transition of my program onto a virtual platform where we use WebEx um, to connect with our participants. And we used another platform that had mass calling and mass texting that we could tell them, hey, we're still open. We can do your services like this. If you call us, we'll do your services over the phone. If you can click this link, we'll do a virtual uh, appointment for you because we understand that you need the services. Um, Unfortunately, uh, with the mandate in 2010, that was all um, of WIC services were to be on an e-WIC card. Georgia was not yet on the WIC card. That was in 2020. It was supposed to be completed by October 2020. We were a little late. But I'm happy to say that we are transitioned now. Uh, so, uh, but during that time, we were we had paper vouchers, um, and so we were actually have to mail out vouchers. So we had two options: we would allow them to, we would mail their vouchers, or they could come pick it up, and we would just have to meet them on the outside and issue them their vouchers. So there were so many things that we had to put in place just to meet the need of participants. But again, it's public health. What are we supposed to do? That's right. what you're here for. You're here to serve your community. And I know that it gets very, it's tough. It's kind of much of a, a strong language. But if that's not where your heart is, then this is not the position for you. Because right. that's what we have to do. You have to serve the community. And you cannot serve the communi- community with an angry or frustrated heart. Um, you have to know that your purpose here is to help everybody that's in need. And you don't get to make a decision of whether you agree or disagree. You serve. And that's what we're doing. And, you know, that it it, it hits all areas. But I can just say for me, it's, it's, it's a very rewarding and feeling. Um, position that I'm in. I'm in a position now being director where I get to make decisions and I get to implement things um, and, and and making sure that I'm trying my best to improve my program, um, taking care of my employees, um, as well as taking care of our population and, you know, our community. That's, that's a pretty awesome story. I, I know you could probably go on for hours. No, no, I see your passion. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for that. I, um, as I mentioned before we chatted, you know, I, I've served in the VA uh, doing home care for nearly 11 years. So I know mm-hmm. the, the passion and the, the love for the work that we do in, in providing service. And so thank you for that work. That, that sounds awesome. So I'm going to switch gears a little and let me ask, you know, you got featured at Fancy on the, on the big screen. How did it feel to see your face up there? And what was your reaction? (laughs) You know what? I did not, I don't know if I just wasn't thinking even after that they spent the whole day with me, we done video, we went to several sites. I showed them what I do. I still don't think it hit home of what was taking place or what they were going to do with that information. So at Fancy, we're all standing in the outside in the lobby waiting to see um, Mr. Damon. Um, And I get a text that says, I think you're going to enjoy your video. And I said, oh, (laughs) when is it going to play? And she said, in the first 10 seconds, 10 minutes of our opening session. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So, So I was kind of caught off guard because I knew it was going to be something at Fancy, but I did not realize the magnitude of it at the time. And I I just didn't. Um, and so I think I kind of stood out, of course, because I was the only African-American, but also I wore head wraps. And I, you know, I, so after that, people like, oh, I saw you, you were on the screen. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. So all of a sudden I get not look, but it's not that I got um requests. I get all these acceptances on my social mm-hmm. media. Yes. Yes. And I'm like, 
And then, and so then I said, it was like, hi, I'll sell you today. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I, I requested you guys for, <laughs> I'm, I'm always going through social media, making requests, especially for dietitians. Like I want my mm-hmm. network to be as big as possible. Yes. Um, I want to be connected with every, cause I think referral, I, I believe that people suffer only because of lack of resources. So if mm-hmm. I can help somebody connect to the right person, um, to the right expert, whether it's for counseling themselves or even if it's for job networking or what it's for, I think that's kind of part of my responsibility. Um, so I'm always trying to connect. So after that, I, I got so many acceptances that, that was <laughs> where I had sent requests, you know, months before. And I think that's just, you know, the opportunity to be on the big screen like that just kind of put a light on me and people are like, oh, okay, now I know who you are. Um, so I now I said, accept your request. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it is, I think that I, I'm hoping that it will continue to open up doors just because I want to do the work that I do on a, on a larger platform, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I, I serve, you know, my job every day is to serve my community. And so with Fancy, I think, um, they took the time to focus on public health and community nutrition. Um, you know, we know that the academy, when it comes time for the examination and the rotations, is very heavy and clinical because medical nutrition therapy is our expertise. That's where we can apply our knowledge and everybody can't do that because we are in one of those professions where everybody thinks they can do it. You know, right. everybody wants to be a nutritionist until it actually comes to applying the knowledge and the evidence-based um, information to the disease state then they don't necessarily have the information or that knowledge or know what to do. And so I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that, you know, the Academy is so heavy on our clinical pieces, but I I really applaud them for um, going outside of that and looking in community based and what people uh, other, you know, entrepreneurship and what other people are doing because dietitians sit in every, every seat. And I think for so long, the amount of education that we have to get just on a bachelor's degree of our biology and chemistry and accounting and all those, you know, experiences on those courses when we get out, you know, many people think that dietitians are not leaders or they shouldn't necessarily sit in directorship, the director seats or the um, state um, leadership seats. But, um, you know, we come out knowing how to set a budget because that's part of what we do, you know? So we we have that experience in accounting and accounting and economics, and we have that experience um, in, in leadership and management skills. Um, but I don't think that there's enough um, information out there about what we can do. And so we kind of get this tunnel vision of a dietitian belongs here, a dietitian belongs here, a dietitian belongs here, but actually we belong everywhere. Um, you know, and we have to make that clear. Um, we have the same knowledge, if not more knowledge, um, than other disciplines that are, are doing those jobs, you know? Um, and so I think that um, we we need to, my, my advice would be to others is don't get stuck into the seat where somebody wants to place you. You identify where you want to go. You set your plan. You make your. You have your vision. You write your steps down, and you get there because you have just as much right to be there as anybody else. And I think that um, just in the work that we do, working with people, talking to people every day, because we know everybody is not interested in giving up that food. That is a very, very difficult profession because the doctor comes in and they tell you what's going on. The nurse comes in, they give you your meds, they give you your shots, you know. Then you got occupational therapy and speech therapy and all of them have a piece. And then there we come in there to tell you what you can and can't eat. <laughs> and like, right, 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 right. I exactly. did not ask you yes. for your two cents and you can make your way exactly. out of here because I'm not changing when I'm eating. And so, you exactly. know. It is is we have a really hard road as dietitians because we're taking care we take we're in many times we're taking away things that are most valuable to them. And you know, people we look at people and say, Oh, they're skinny or they're overweight, but people don't take the time to think about what took place in the background to get them to that mm-hmm. that point. 
you know, you say, oh my, you've gained weight. Instead of saying, how are you doing? What's going on? You know, can we grab coffee one day? Because you don't know, there could be anything from hormonal issues to marriages, to loss, you know, family loss, things. We are driven by the food that we eat. We have comfort food. And when we're hurt, what we do, we eat. You know, when we want to celebrate what we do, we eat. <laughs> so mm -hmm. in all of this, we're eating, but yet we're not recognizing the experts that have the information and the knowledge um, to help guide us in these situations to make better choices for ourselves. And, you know, for myself, that's uh, I labeled, I, I developed my own little platform uh, through the summer called Challenge Your Choices Dietetics. And it's not out to make, I'm not out to sell a product or make money. It's just to have conversation and communicate with people who are being challenged and don't know how to make choices that are better for themselves. And, and we have to dis decide for our own lives, what's the better choice for us? What's going to benefit us in our health, our well-being, our mental capacity, everything um, is, is the choices that we make that we have to improve to have a better outcome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I can tell you that, uh, you know, definitely, um, you know, through your trials and tribulations doing WIC and your volunteer service and everything you've done, and it just, it kind of, we are uh, capable of serving in multiple capacities. So it's good to hear. And I'm, it was great to see you on the big screen. I was on the big screen in Nashville. I believe that was 2015. And everyone's like, oh my God, that's the person in the video. And, you know, that's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of wild, you know, because yeah. you're like, you're sitting here, you're enjoying yourself. And then, you know, you you feel like people are talking about you yeah. and, you know, it, the friend requests and everything. And it was, it was good to see. So thank you. Yeah, I, you I'm a little celebrity in your own yes, environment. Yeah, yeah. 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 So no, that's awesome. <laughs> and so, it's crazy because yeah. people want to know, how did you get there? And this is the yeah. one thing with fancy that you can't apply for. And I think that's really important for people to know. I got more questions on, hey, how did you apply for that? I didn't. I do right, a, I, I'm right. not new to this. I've been doing this for 22 years. You do a work and people recognize the work that you do. So I didn't apply for that. You know, that exactly. was just, it was just recognition for, hey, she's doing this and she's been doing this for this long. Let's talk to her. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. So the next question for you, you know, if you could do it all over again in your career, what would you change or what would you keep the same? Um, I appreciate where I am. Um, I think I know it's, it, uh, let me, it's let me so, just preface this. It's a hard question to answer because I feel like everyone I've chatted with so far it's like, you know, the journey is unique to you. And yeah. so most people may not want to change too much because through your trials and tribulations, you are who you are. Right. Um, but if there is something that, you know, maybe it's like, well, maybe I could have pursued a doctorate or whatever. I, I don't know. Just kind of if you had to if you had to do it all over again, you know, you could take yourself back to 2002 or whenever, you know, you started. What, what would you change or maybe not? Yeah, um, I think the way that I handled, um, I had a lot, a lot of pushback. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. Um, when I was actually offered my job, this is how my, this is how I was offered my job. And not many pe people know this is the person that offered me my job who doesn't work with public health anymore. Um, we have a position um, that I know you apply for, and I'm aware that you um, are still interested. Um, so the person I chose didn't want the position. So if you want it, it's yours. That's kind of how I was offered the job. Um, so I was kind of told up front that I didn't really want you, but I'm, I'm, I'm calling you because I know that you've asked questions. And basically, my management told me I got to call and offer you the job. That's kind of what way it came down. And and I didn't respond negatively. I was like, sure, when do I start? Um, but I think that built up this determination to prove I belong somewhere. Um, 
over the years, I've learned that it's not necessarily a bad thing to cut your losses um, if you're not being treated the way that you are being treated, um, the, the way that everybody else, you know, that you, if you're not being treated in a way that's conducive to your learning and growth. Um, but I think it's different for different people. And for me, my personality is such a fight, very much a fighter um, instinct that I was determined to kind of prove um, my worth and where I belong that I think that I don't necessarily think it stunted my growth. I think I learned, I experienced a lot, but it, the experience was very daunting and um, created a lot of darkness for me that it took me a long time to get to a place where like to really trust that people actually wanted to know my thoughts and what I'd done because I, I had been in the first three years of employment was really um, heavy as far as reiterating that I I didn't belong or I was not really that I didn't belong, but I wasn't wanted um, in that position. But I, the, the upside of that is people are not often in a position that they can speak up, but they do witness. And so I can say now some of those people that witness that are consistently saying how excited they are to see where I am now because they don't think they could have made it through those hardships. Um, but I think that's just in my, in my seat of diversity, you know, li liaison for idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access because of those experiences, I understand that, um, that, being off of the job or being in a place does not mean that you're receiving equitable resources and that, you know, I mean, it's so much, so, so much to that, that I don't necessarily think I will change it. I think that the way I responded in some ways probably would have been different because I, my response then was out of fear and anger, um, fear that, I couldn't stay or wouldn't be able to stay and angry that I was having to be, that I was going through things that my counterparts, you know, were not, my colleagues were not. Um, and so I learned, I dealt with it um, out of frustration and a whole lot of unnecessary stress that kind of, if I knew that I was going to be in the position that I'm in now, that I probably would have fought that fight a little differently. Um, but when you don't have resources, which brings me back, that's always back my grandma. When you don't have resources or the support that you need, um, you kind of don't know what to do. So you 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 tackle it the best way you can. I, I do think that if I had cut my losses, that I probably wouldn't be in this seat, um, or I could have been. I could be in doing it in a different part of the state. You know, you right. know, you just never know. I, I can't really go back. But what I can say is that my my environment and my support system, my leadership that I currently have has been nothing but encouraging and supportive that, um, you know, one of them said to me a few years ago, uh, ago is I know that was hard for you and I apologize that I wasn't in a place to help you, but now you keep being you and you keep being excellent in what you do and that's what's going to speak for you. And all I can say is that that was right. You know, now, um, I mean, that's that's truly what has happened over the past few years. But so I don't necessarily think that I would have changed a whole lot. Just maybe my responses. But we live, we grow, we learn, we mature. Right. Yeah, I, I would say probably that's that is probably one of the hardest things for some people to not fully grasp is the um internalized pressure we put on ourselves and you are um you you essentially end up with a chip on your shoulder and you're trying yes. to prove people wrong instead of you're 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 motivated but you're motivated kind of in a stressful way instead yes. of in a positive beneficial way yes. and and you know once you uh the chip on the shoulder stays there whether you mm -hmm. like it or not so you need mm -hmm. to learn how to tamper it down so you're not like because you're you know you're trying to prove people you know, wrong instead of doing it benevolently. And yeah, I can talk about this all day long. Yeah, so I, feel, I, mean, I, feel good. I feel good. But I think it's such, it's so common, especially in minorities. And I think we, we get that, that stereotypical harsh tone or loud, you know, 
because because that's what we're dealing with. Right. And you don't know, you don't, you know, besides saying I belong here or this is what I'm supposed to be doing, like you really kind of feel like you're losing a fight and you don't really understand why, you know. And so I do, I think. But as we grow, we kind of use that anger for good and we turn right. it into ways that we can learn. But, you know, the one thing that I have made a promise to myself um, and is that I will never, ever and put my employees in a position where you're crying every day to come to work because it's so much stress right. or you just hate that environment that you're, I, I try to take notice of everybody. If a person is staying away, why are they staying away? If they're closed off, why are they closed off? Um, because you shouldn't have to deal. You, we deal with a lot. First of all, you know, just being able to pay your bills and worrying about putting gas in your tank to come to work every day, you shouldn't have to worry about being in an environment that doesn't accept you there. So, you right. know, you know that that's just a whole nother level of stress that we shouldn't be, we, we shouldn't have to deal with. And I think that many of us have dealt with that. But what we need to do is take that experience and use it to better the environment for the next person. Right, right. Exactly. We, we've been through it. We can hopefully the generations that come afterwards are in a better are in a better place so yeah, right definitely. yeah yeah okay well cool next question for you what does the future hold for you i know you're going to pursue your doctorate or you're almost done like what what else do you yeah. think's in the works for you i don't know you know my twins i have two that are in college and my twins are 13 so when i started my doctorate i was thinking okay because I was a baby to public health, I'll retire, Lord's willing, I'll be 53, 54 when I retire. So my thoughts about get, uh, getting my doctorate was after retirement with the state, what do I want to do? Um, I do, you know, I want to increase my platform with public public health um, policy advocacy. Um, is I really have a heart for um for public policy, um, removing health, you know, the health disparities and the access that we don't have or people don't have is very, um, it, it's just to me to know, to see it and know it and can't do nothing about it is, is, is tugs at your heart. Um, so in the future, I think that I probably spend more time advocating um, in whatever pathway that I need to um, to help people get treatment that they need to be, you know, that they need to receive in healthcare. Um, you know, it's sad because we're, we're, we're in this program with WIC program, you know, we're prenatals and postpartum moms, infants, and FH to, uh, up to age five. Uh, the nutrition service standards, which is, a uh, in, um, instructions from USDA, um, National Work Association for roles and qualifications and things of the positions that uh, are in WIC. There are recommendations, but they're not always upheld. Um, I say that, but even after the ages of WIC, because, you know, we have dietitians, we have health educators, we have a variety of people that work within WIC, but the focus on the expertise of dietitians, I think, is very lacking um, because we do see children who have GI problems and we have, you know, moms who are gestational diabetics and hypertension and then, you know, but this is a preventative program. So there's not a whole lot of necessary uh, focus or individual care when it comes to that. And the reason I bring that up is because the opposite side of that is what do we have from state to state where dietitians can connect with these moms, these babies, these, you know, these individuals. And then from that age, from age five to like teenage years, that's not a whole lot out there. You know, if you have a, a child that's type one diabetic, they see their doctor and their nurse. And then when do they get to see the dietitian? You know, right, right, um, right. What what is the the dietitian that owns their own private practice? How they can how can they connect with these people if the people can't afford to pay? You know, cash pay is good for those who have income to be able to pay that, but it's not so good for the people who are underserved. Um, right. 
and that's a large part of our community and that and you know so it's just so much out there that is that is missing there's there they they're just they just don't have resources so when you look at the outcomes over the next 20 years what does that mean for that child who was unable to receive care or counseling or you know following from a registered dietitian that was um they were diagnosed with uh, a disease early on a nutrition related disease that you know their health could have been altered by the expertise of a dietitian but the resources are not there the the insurance um you know options are not available for them so what does that mean for that individual um and i just i say that on a personal note because my son who's 13 one of my twins i have a boy and a girl in 2020 um he had a stroke and there was nothing that led up to it. He was, you know, football, playing uh, travel ball and everything. And then for a couple of weeks, we had been going to the gym and, and he said his heart was racing. And I really thought he was just trying to get out of going to the gym. And so we <laughs> we stopped going, you know, I stopped taking him a few nights. And by the third week, you know, he was like his arms and stuff was hurting. I, I, I didn't think anything about it, but this was also right before COVID, you know, right in the time COVID had hit. And um, my oldest son, birthday is October 21st, and, and we had celebrated his birthday. And as we were leaving the restaurant, my, my, my younger son said, Mom, I can feel my heart racing. So I took him home and I, I took his blood pressure and it was off the wall and his heart rate was up to 125 oh, wow. and i took him to the local hospital and we stayed there all night and this is one of those situations i i took him to the lo local hospital because it was closer when i should have taken him to a children's hospital we stayed there all night and went home with a prescription for lisinopril his heart rate was still up his blood pressure was still up his blood pressure was 180 over 120. Oh and we still was sent home. And so when I called the doctor, when I called his pediatrician, I went in the next day. She said, no, you need to come in now. And um, they said, we can't let you go back home. We, I, I, and she said, I don't have anything to say about whoever you've seen before now. But right now you're going to the hospital and you can. She said, you have an option. You can either get in the ambulance with him or you can take him in your vehicle, but he uh -huh. has to go to the hospital. And I think it was, it was then, um, I, I, I was fighting for him, but the ball had been dropped so much. And so when I got to, we, we was in children's healthcare in Atlanta for three days. Um, and so and then he was sent home, but we had to go right back. Um, and then on the last visit, this was all, this was in the month of October. The last visit was October 30th. And my oldest son was on homecoming court. So we was trying to get him dismissed so we could get to see, you know, because that's life. So at this time, you know, we've had so many things going Going on. My husband is not there. We're separated. I got four children. I'm just pushing. I'm just trying to get there. So we got to be home for the oldest because this is his senior year. He's on homecoming court. And I look around after walking my son out on the field. I look around and I hear my son, my youngest son talking to my nephew. He says, I can't even smile. He was like, and I thought it was because it was cold. And I heard him. I turned around and I said, smile. And he said, I said, let's go. We got in the car and we went up to um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and um, they kept us all night. When they released us the next morning, um, I immediately got a call and said, hey, you have an appointment Monday. You need to be here to see the specialist. And the specialist told us he had, had a stroke. Yeah. Um, it was just so much was dropped. And I can remember going to the hospital, we, even when they sent us to Atlanta, the person that we saw first, once we got into the ER said, oh, I'm sure it's not a stroke. I mean, he's too young for that. We'll check him out. It's probably just muscle spasms. I said, sir, I understand that you are a nurse, but I've been doing what I've been doing for many years. Mm -hmm. And I know the signs and symptoms and somebody's going to see my son and they, he's going to be seen immediately. And I'm thankful that they took pictures because when we saw the neurologist, she said that had they not took the pictures, they, they probably never would have realized that it was a stroke 
Mm -hmm. um, but because of the way his tongue went and the, the expressions on his face and things that he could not do immediately, they knew that it was. But thank God, over time, those things came back, you know, normalized again. Um, and so by that time, he they had put him on with Centerprill, but we started seeing our, our local cardiologist who has maintained and helped him. Um, but, you know, through that whole process, I w I'm a dietitian, but they didn't know I was a dietitian. Right. Never right. referred him to a dietitian. Never. It's been two years. October 30th, 30th will be two years. Never referred to a dietitian. Right. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that uh, that's probably one of the things that we need to do a better job of advocating for is, you know, nutrition throughout the life cycle. You're dealing with the bottom end. I've dealt with the top end and it's the people in the middle that need the services. So right. you know, that was a yeah. very, very uh, enlightening story. And I, and I hope your son, you know, continues to to do well. That's uh, very sad to hear because I'm sure they're like, oh, he's young. He'll be fine. He'll, he'll. Yeah, yeah. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You know, and that could be the furthest thing from the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to keep you all day. I loved having you. Thank you for everything. So the final question for you is, do you have any words of wisdom for the next generation of dietitians? Oh, wow. Um, um, I would say that our job comes from the heart. Um, I know that, um, the marketing piece of nutrition is a billion dollar industry, but that's not where the knowledge and expertise is. And I would say to focus on knowing and being able to offer the counseling and advice that the other parts or the that that they can't or they don't know because that's where your true um expertise is and that stay on your podium in your platform because um evidence base is evidence base and that's what's keep that's that's where the health is that's where the health and improvement is we can do things for the outside or what to look like for the outside all day every day but what does the inside of your body looks like, look like and that's where the sustainability and the growth and everything comes from is taking care of your health so to any young dietitian i would just say focus on learning um, learning everything that's per, that's put before you so that you can be able to use that knowledge um, in the future to whatever platform. Because we as dietitians, we have certain focuses, but a dietitian has to know a whole lot about everything to make a good decision, to make referrals, or to even start from flat, from from one place to be able to follow the process um, to make recommendations. And um, I would also say attention to detail. I've never been that person, but I've learned that attention to detail, you catch so many things that have fallen by the wayside that if you pay attention, you're able to help your clients in no matter what situation. So just stay focused, study hard, and don't give up. Never give up. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. I'm also on the platform Buy Me A Coffee. This is a platform that allows creators like myself to create content and get rewarded in a variety of payments. I've decided to do it via coffee. So if you'd like to buy me a coffee, you can do so. And if you want to send one to the individual I'm interviewing, send it to me and I will send it their way. With that being said, thank you very much for being here with us today. I hope you really enjoyed the video and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.